name is Marcela Torres. I'm the Community Engagement and Public Programs Manager. Since 1983, Gallery 400 has been the contemporary art gallery at the University of Illinois, Chicago. We organize five to six exhibitions per year featuring work by local, national, and international artists. Join us for our fall exhibition, Chicago Disability Arts and Design at the Center of the Disability Rights Movement, opening on September 7th, 2018. Curating Otherwise is our final program for the current exhibition, Out of Easy Reach closing August 4th at um, Gallery 400. Out of Easy Reach is a monumental exhibition in collaboration with Gallery 400, the Paul Art Museum, and the Rebuild Foundation, curated by Allison and M. Glenn. This exhibition explores how female-identifying artists from the Black and Latin diaspora are using various forms of abstraction to navigate, respond to, and embrace the contemporary world. The exhibition features myriad ways that Three generations of artists use abstraction as a tool to explore both personal and universal histories with an emphasis on mapping, migration, archives, landscape, vernacular culture, language, and the body. Tonight's presentation, Curating Other Eyes, explains questions of contemporary curatorial approaches to racialized exhibition practices. Some of these questions include the pol politics of visibility, inclusivity, and institutional representation, while other tr others trouble the notion of minoritized or marginalized artistic practices. This panel discussion will focus on curatorial practices that navigate complex identities, histories, institutional limitations, and artistic, curatorial, and art historical conventions in presenting the work of black and brown and indigenous artists. So tonight, um, the moderator is going to be some Sam Aranka. Okay. Um, and she's the assistant professor of art history theory and criticism at the School of Art, um, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Her research interests include performance theories of embodiment, visual culture, and black cultural and aesthetic theories. Her work has been published in EFLUX, Art Forum, Art Journal, um, and Transcript, an interdisciplinary online journal in the humanities and social sciences at UC Irvine. She has written catalog essays for Sadie Barnett, Kamboy Olujimi, and Zachary Fabri. She's currently working on her book manuscript entitled Death, Death's Future, uh, Futurity, <laughs> um, The Visual Culture of Death in Black Radical Politics. Allison M. Glenn, curator of Out of Easy Reach, and associate curator of contemporary art at the Crystal Bridges Museum and American um, Museum of American Art. She was previously the manager of publications and curatorial associate for Prospect 4, The Lotus and Spy of the Swamp, which opened November 2017. Janet Dees is the Stephen and uh, Lisa Munster Ten Tenbaum Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Block Museum of Art, Northwestern University. Prior to her appointment at the Block in September 2015, she was curator at Site Santa Fe, where she had held various curatorial positions since 2008. Dees was a part of the curatorial team for Unsettled Landscapes 2014, the inaugural Site, site, site Lines, New Perspectives on Art of the American, America's Biennial, and has curated exhibitions and produced new commissions with a wide variety of contemporary artists. Risa Paleo is an, inter, uh, is an independent curator. Her exhibition, Monarchs, Brown and Native Arts, Artists in the Path of the Butterfly, opened at Bemis Center um, of Contemporary Arts in Omaha in December 2017. She is, curr is currently on view at the Museum of Contemporary Arts, North Miami, and will travel to Blue Star Contemporary and Southwest School of Art in San Antonio, Texas the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Arts in Overland Park, Kansas, and the Soap Factory in Minneapolis. The exhibition catalog will be published this month by Name Publications. <sighs> All right, thank you, everyone. <laughs> I'm going to turn this over to Sam now. Hi, everyone. It's a full house. 
Um, this is amazing. I think we're going to have a great conversation today. I'm so humbled and grateful to be on a panel with these amazing curators. Marcella, thanks for hosting us in Gallery 400. Um, so I'll, I just have like a couple of introductory remarks to frame what we'll be doing today, and then we're really going to turn it over to these brilliant practitioners, um, and we'll go into a conversation for a little bit, and then turn it over to you. So you better have questions. There's nothing like awkward silence at a conversation. Um, OK. Out of Easy Reach features works by 24 artists and, ex and it has been exhibited across Chicago's DePaul Art Museum, Stony, Islands Art, Stony Island Arts Bank, and right here in Gallery 400. This, exhibition's, this exhibition focuses on uses of abstraction since 1980 by black and Latinx artists from across the spectrum of women. Plotting a dynamic range of styles, techniques and historical affiliations, the show is organized around intertwined conceptual frameworks, including mapping, migration, archives, vernacular culture, and the body. Featured artists include Candida Alvarez, who's here tonight, Barbara Chase Rabot, Howardina Pindell, Marin Hassinger, Ayanna Moore, I see you in the back there, Juliana Huxtable, and Lisa Alvarado. While each venue's exhibition could be discussed as a solitary unit, the exhibition should also be afforded the more difficult task of thinking interinstitutionally. Martine Sims' stellar 10 photograph series, More Than Some, Less Than Others, which is right here in Gallery 400, recalls Javria Simmons's On Sculpture 2, installed at DePaul Art Museum. Both performatively engage with histories of conceptual photography to form a kind of seamless art historical derive. We can think of Sims's work as being shaped by the smoggy sunlight specific to Los Angeles. I'm an LA girl, so that's very important to me. Alongside Simmons's departure from Kenneth Josephson into the ocean's deep memory of the transatlantic slave trade. And its focus on abstraction out of easy reach strives to relieve the exhibiting artists of the representational mandates often placed on women artists and artists of color. On the occasion of this exhibition, today's panel quest uh, explores questions of, the contemp of contemporary curatorial approaches to racializing exhibition practice. To begin, each panelist will give a three-minute taste of their curatorial approaches, and then we'll dive into some conversations that I've, or questions that I've pre-planned, and then we'll kind of turn it to you. Janet, Risa, and Allison approach these questions of subjectivity as particularly spatial, material, sensorial, and affective, thus opening up a space where exhibition making itself can be thought of as an aesthetic protocol. What all three curators have in common is a deep commitment to rethink how the shapes, shadows, and senses of racial formation are central to exhibition making. While their approaches are varied, they allow us to ask questions about the presentation of race in the museum or the gallery, such that we can address the politics of viewership, the pleasures of encounter, and perhaps the capacity to form other versions of ourselves. So to get started, we'll turn it to Janet. You're first. Okay. Um, you can go ahead to the first slide. Thank you, Marcella. Um, so by way of my quick introduction, um, I just wanted to give a couple of quick snapshots and a, a few recent exhibitions that I've worked on that in anticipation of some of the questions that um, we're going to get into later that um, Sam shared with us prior to the panel. Um, so uh, there are two projects that I worked on for the Block Museum here at, um, at Northwestern University, um, and then one in my previous position at Site Santa Fe. So the first um, quick exhibition I want to talk about is one that was entitled Experiments in Form, Sam Gilliam, Alan Shields, and Frank Stella. That was on view at the block earlier this year. Um, that was a very, it was a, um, a small exhibition that was meant more of a, as a kind of a prov provocation rather than a statement. Um, and it was instigated by the acquisition of our museum um, through a gift of one of Sam Gilliam's straight paintings from 1970 entitled One. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, so what I was thinking about was how to contextualize this work within our collection um, and think about um, you know, um, Gilliam's practice and um, taking um, 
painting into three dimensions and thinking about what that meant and his interest in color and materiality and what um, other artists were in our collection um, that he had connections um, to and chose and happened upon the work of Alan Shields and Frank Stella. And so thinking about um, how, like what were the kind of material and aesthetic questions that he was asking of the work and what were some of his contemporaries that were engaged in similar questions as a way of situating um, his practice. Um, the second um, exhibition, we can go to the next slide, um, is um, one that I wanted to mention is entitled Unsuspected Possibilities, um, which was the, one of the last exhibitions I curated at Site Santa Fe before moving to Chicago. Um, and it included the work of Leonardo Drew, Marie Watt, and Sarah Oppenheimer. Um, and this also, I think, connects to one strain of my practice that's really interested in artists who are thinking about materiality and spatial relationships. And this was um, bringing together these artists so that they could think um, um, kind of collaboratively about the space and how they might create an exhibition and dialogue with each other um, that highlighted these different aspects of their work. And so what you see here um, is an installation of several works by the um, artist Marie Watt, um, who often works um, with blankets as, as, a, as, a, as her kind of primary material to create um, abstract and sometimes representational um, compositions. In the background is a, a sculpture um, by, from Leon, by Leonardo Drew. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, um, Sarah Oppenheimer's um, intervention in this is um, an artist that thinks about um, architecture and kind of collapsing spaces. And her interventions um, are often getting us to think, um, to kind of break through what our conventional understanding of the spaces are that, you know, things that we might ap appear to be um, separated or apart, actually there are ways of bringing them and collapsing together. And so this is just a view that you can see um, both of Marie Watts and Leonardo Drew's work through Sarah's intervention. And then the last, um, quickly, I wanted to mention was an um, exhibition that I um, curated here at the Block Museum, which was entitled If You Remember, I'll Remember, um, and wanted to show how that first work that we saw, um, if you go back, by Marie Watt, which was included in the previous exhibition, is now in a different context. And we need to think about how um, a work can be read differently depending upon the context in which it's situated. So in the case of the show with Sarah and um, Sarah Oppenheimer and Leonardo Drew is really a focus on the kind of materiality of uh, Marie's practice. Um, and in this exhibition, it was also about that materiality, but also thinking more about her kind of the concepts of her practice and her interest in um, history and archives. So this was an exhibition, we can go to the next. Um, slide um, that included um, seven contemporary artists um, Christina Iono, um, Dario Roberto, uh, Marie Watt, Samantha Hill, who's based here in Chicago, um, Shan Gorson, and um, McCallum and Terry, uh, um, a collaborative. And this exhibition was really interested in um, thinking about artists who engaged in research in the archives to go back to moments in, um, particular moments, troubled moments within American history, and to think about moments that oftentimes aren't necessarily considered in relationship to each other. So Marie Watt's piece, for example, um, there's, there's an embroidery on it that's based on an archival pho a photograph of a um, Kwamachan um, potlatch from um, the 19, early, 19, uh, early 20th century, which at that time, the potlatches were out, outlawed, and so she sort of saw this as an act of civil dis disobedience, um, and for her kind of resonated with the Black Lives Matter movement. Whereas another work by Christina Ono, um, if we go to the next slide, which you can kind of see across this wall, um, which was entitled The Nail That Sticks Up the Farthest, um, was really engaging with the history of Japanese American internment during World War II. And it was a 40, over 40 foot um, long um, piece in which the background of the work were um, photocopies of um, testimonies from the um, 1980s um, Commission on the um, Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. And this was really one of the first times where many Japanese Americans who had been interned in the camp spoke publicly about their experience, and that's kind of creating the backdrop of their work. So just to give you an example um, of the range of works that were in the exhibition. So I think I'll leave it there.
So in August of 2016, I began having a conversation with the director of the Bemis Center for Contemporary Art in Omaha, Nebraska, about living in Omaha for a year and making an exhibition that responded to the research that I would do there. And if you remember August 2016, it was kind of a sea change moment, and two things were happening um, just north of Omaha and then quite a bit south. And one of those things was Standing Rock. The other was a presidential campaign that was um, founded on a promise to build a border wall. And for me, growing up in San Antonio, Texas, I saw those two sort of political events as deeply entangled in ways that I didn't feel anybody was talking about. For me, they represented, on one hand, um, occupational desires to um, enclose people who are indigenous to the Americas in reservation type situations or create a border that was impassable. Um, so I proposed monarchs, brown and native artists in the path of the butterflies, bringing these two groups of artists together and then also artists who had backgrounds such as mine, which meant like assimilated in like being in the right place at the right time and then being guaranteed American citizenship, however uncomfortable that may be. So I moved to Omaha, Nebraska, and started doing research um, via road trip um, across Nebraska through the Dakotas. I went to Standing Rock and Oklahoma, and then started filling out what became this exhibition. Um, the monarch butterfly actually was kind of a, a metaphor that came late to the game um, because I realized that the area that I was traveling in was also like the most trafficked path of the monarch. And so it became, um, if you could just like roll the slides, yeah. Um, it became a way to think about what the artists that I were doing, uh, was working with, were thinking about a number of issues um, that were personally and politically important at the moment. So migration, um, certainly the monarch migrates, but I was also really interested in working with artists who were thinking about um, the impossibility of movement. So this is a installation by an artist, two artists, Chinupa Hanska Luger and Marty Tubles, both um, Chinupa's from Standing Rock and Marty's from Pine Ridge. And it's 15 feet of ceramic bottles and wine glasses and beer butts and they're set up as like a drunken target practice and spoke to me really about like serial boredom and being entrapped in a place. Um, transformation, butterflies transform. And so there was a way that I saw that artists were engaging with material and process-based um, practices as a way of accessing a spiritual plane um, and that became a theme of the exhibition. This is an amazing coat by Jeffrey Gibson, which I believe you've shown too, Janet. Um, not, it was in the one that I, but yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's next? how artists were grappling with placing themselves in space, but also in time. And so there became um, certain meditations on the archive, how to um, establish yourself when the archive of your presence has been ex destroyed, and how do you move forward into the future without, with, while also writing your past. And I saw how artists were thinking through that question through science fiction, Salvador Jimenez Flores, Flores is here in the audience um, with this really incredible ceramic nopal, uh, resistance of the hybrid nopal, but also doing deep archival research projects like Guadalupe Rosales, who's based in Los Angeles. And so bringing these artists together was also about um, what came out was a lot of like variety of mediums, materials, and process, and then abstraction became the kind of primary mode for thinking about these questions of like indigeneity and being in this place at this particular moment. Hey, so. Um it's interesting because I gave a talk earlier today about the exhibition and um, there's so many different ways to talk about it, but in three minutes, it's kind of a challenge. But if you could 
start, just keep going through the slides. I think one thing to start with is the title. Um, I think this will really set the stage for a lot of the metaphor that um, kind of strings through the exhibition. So this was taken from an essay that Thomas Lax wrote in 2008, and it was about Leslie Hewitt's work, and this is, oh, the, um, yeah. This is Leslie Hewitt's work here. Um, it's in the front gallery at, um, here at Gallery 400. And the way he talks about this work, he says it's, quote, pushed back by a disappearing perspective, the objects and the memories they reference are out of easy reach, end quote. And that, for me, um, is really a great way to kind of enter the exhibition and enter the conversation. These 24 artists who happen to be female identifying, who happen to be from the larger Black and Latinx diasporas, all of, these, all of this information that is kind of brought to the exhibition actually only exists in the context of the exhibition because of um, omission. So because so many of these artists have not been included in, in these exhibitions that have happened over the past 40 years that are looking at abstraction, it's important to call this out. It's important to speak about how these women have been hidden in plain sight um, and how often you know, the, you can be in the room with all of your friends and not get the recognition. And there's so many artists that have been working for so long. Um, and so there's four particular, there's four artists that I, I'm not sure if this is in this slide, but there's four artists that I identify as kind of the front runners or like the cornerstone to the exhibition. And they're Candida Alvarez, Marin Hassinger, Barbara Chase Rabot, and um, Howardina Pindell. <laughs> <laughs> and through these four artists, the, to the 20 artists that come after were subsequently born in the two generations, um, either generation, uh, either the millennial generation or generation Y. Um, and within this, I mean, I feel like there's so much I could dive into, but I will, um, if you could just go to the next slide. So I'll just talk about one particular moment that's happening at Gallery 400. So this intergenerational play was super important. So the exhibition begins in 1980. And I don't know how many people saw uh, Naomi Beckwith's uh, exhibition, her retrospective with Howardina Pindell, but we didn't have any conversations prior. Um, I really enjoy how she also, she and Valerie, identify 1980 as a certain important, as an important moment. Um, so Out of Easy Reach starts in 1980 with this work on the left. And in this 12-minute video, Pindell employs the theatricality of performance to expose and interrogate the various ways stereotypes are projected upon one's physicality. Though this film is unique in Pindell's oeuvre, it is integral to Out of Easy Reach for several reasons. As the oldest work in the exhibition, it acts as an anchor, bridging the performance practices of the late 1970s and early 80s with those of younger artists such as Juliana Huxtable, seen here on the right. Huxtable, who's a transgender woman, uses her body as a site, creating photographs and text-based works to present a subject position that sits alongside, but outside of, what has been determined to be normative, extending Piper's object objectification of the self as a way to subvert the cisgender gaze. So this work on the left is called New Ob Chair. In this photograph, Huxtable imagines herself as a follower of the New, New Obian Nation, which is a radical religious sect, sect that combine Judeo-Christian and esoteric beliefs. And what I really thought was uh, an exciting kind of pairing was not only the way that these artists are employing theatricality, so performance, and, um, but also how they're using their bodies, right? And so we're talking about abstraction. And what I really ask the viewer to do is go on this journey with me in all of these different spaces and think about how, how these common descriptors that we use to talk about abstraction might not necessarily be, necessarily be applicable to all bodies, all artists. And so asking for these um, new understandings of how we think of abstraction. And I think I'll just leave it there. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'll get us going, I think, do you mind actually, Marcella, leaving one of the install shots from here at for us? Anyone, you pick. Um, yeah, great. So one of the kind of opening questions, I think, Allison, you really se segued us into this question. And I'm wondering if all of you can reflect a little bit about around 
A, how you're thinking about the term abstraction, which we've all seemed to be dancing around this idea that it's historically loaded or it's based on a certain kind of um, particularity, right, where we don't name that it signals a certain kind of relationship to whiteness or cisness or, you know, these kind of normative approaches to gender or sexuality. So maybe we can start with how you're thickening that or how you're approaching that question and relatedly um, how you're mobilizing the term abstraction or or not right in your actual curatorial method so there's one thing around the works themselves either deploying or resisting working against or through this notion of abstraction but how are you thinking about it in your curatorial choices right and in your um, approach to how you create an exhibition Yeah, I can start. I mean, for Out of Easy Reach, um, it was really about not only, well, you said, how do I define abstraction? I mean, relying on some of the moves, so some of the formal devices, such as redra redaction, although redaction isn't, does, abstraction doesn't own redaction, right? But these, these moves that are linked to mark making, that is linked to commonly held descriptive terms, such as um, painterly, gestural, or hard-edged, right? So borrowing or relying on some of those formal devices, but really imbuing it with a, with a specific set of concerns. And sometimes, like Juliana and Howardina, they're socio-political, they're tied to the body, they're, ta they're tied to mapping, migration, you know, in some ways they're tied to nothing that has anything to do with a body, overtly. Um, but for me, it's really, um, it, this is reliant, the, the whole premise of this exhibition is reliant on um, defining new language to, or, or identifying new ways to talk about abstraction that exists outside of normative terms that we're used to. So I'll follow up on that because um, my conversation with abstraction began 10 or 15 years ago and I as being a part of a conversation around what queer abstraction is or what it is to make work queerly. And I think that there's been kind of two strains of that, like how to make work that doesn't represent the body. And then another idea that I've pushed for and I think is happening in Monarchs as well, which is how not only to not represent the body, but to um, highlight the ephemeral or the sensorial or the embodied or the affective um, as distinct sort of modes of being versus like sort of representing. And I think that comes up in the exhibition in that I kind of forced the audience to grapple with the materiality and the physicality of the work um, by not giving any textual clues. By really wanting to like highlight what it means to be in front of a painting or a group of works that literally like glow and have like, like such a luminous sort of presence and what kind of relationship that invokes within your own body as a sensation or physicality. Um. Um, and I think to answer that question, I may um, think about sort of three concrete examples. I think one is thinking about abstraction kind of in similarly to the terms in Allison, which you started out in this sort of very um, sort of narrow, in a sort of narrow art historical way that has to deal with um, non-objectivity and an interest in materiality and composition and color and form apart from um, representation. And so like I think about, for example, um, you know, uh, Sam Gill the, the work that I did with the Sam Gilliam painting and sort of thinking about other artists who were his peers who he was engaging with, like Alan Shields, who they were friends and had a dialogue that were interested in similar interest. So in that kind of definition, um, I also think about abstraction in a kind of more kind of capacious way that um, I think inc is inclusive, like the range of practices that we see um, in this exhibition, but also that thinks about like alternative histories of abstraction. So like, um, you know, working with um, like um, Marie Watt, who's like a who's a Seneca artist, or I didn't know that. Um, 
and there was like one of the, in the first installation, there's a piece there that is like abstracted from a jingle dress or that's abstract. So like where she's like drawing upon like other histories of um, other art histories um, and the kind of way those are intersecting and kind of creating alternate art. Um, I don't want to say alternate, but um, not the ones that we usually um, foreground. It maybe is a better way to construct that. Um, so I think about um, it in that terms. And then I also think about it as a, um, operation. I think one of the other questions, one of the other parts of your question was about like abstraction in relation to representation, not just in terms of um, work, but in terms of um, artists and who, who they are and who they, how they identify culturally. And thinking about um, the, when we create, kind of creating an exhibition, you're kind of creating a lens and through which the work is being seen or how artists work are being engaged with and how um, that is though always at sometimes a step removed from like the individual um, kind of concerns of a particular practice and and um, so also sort of thinking about like that dynamic and how that may or may not relate to like um, cultural identification. So I sort of think about it in those three ways. Um, could you maybe speak a little bit to how it, how the idea of abstraction gets mobilized in your in the choices that you've made in your exhibition practice as well? Sure. Um, well, I, I think I to go off of something Janet said when uh, towards the end of your comment, what kept coming to mind when you said alternative art histories was decentralizing, and I think that's really what our collective curatorial practices do um, is decentralize. Um, these art histories. And so, um, let's see, where I, I feel like there's so much to talk about. Um, so how abstraction is mobilized? Um, well, this is not, I mean, this is a good image, but I would say maybe not. You know what, can I think about that yeah. for a minute? And yeah, do, are the two of you gonna answer this question also? a little bit because, you know, Risa, you, you talk about the sensorial, for example, and I'm, I'm kind of curious about this, this place, right? The, the place where as, a, uh, as somebody that makes exhibitions, as somebody that um, is really putting together a kind of experience, right, for a viewer, there seems to be this, like, um, a productive tension between the aims, the materialities, the, the, affect of the work, right? The practices and processes that artists take on um, to either swerve the protocols of representation or mm -hmm. question them or maybe um, inflict upon us a different kind of relationship to surveillance or policing, right? Or of the body under these kinds of racial codes or gender codes. And I'm curious as to, that's, that to me is what abstraction can do at its best, right? Or even conceptualism can do at its best. And so I'm, cur I'm curious about as you're, you're putting together a space, right? Or putting together um, an environment, or what, how you might develop that approach in those decisions that you're making um, so that, or if that's something that's a priority for you, right? right? Um, that's helpful, that, yeah. that gives more context a bit to the question. Um, so visibility is a really important thing and I'll say in the center galleries at DePaul, there's two works in particular, one by Bethany Collins and another by Ayanna Moore and they're also serial works so they're, they're you know, mul there's multiple components. Um, and in both Ayanna and Bethany's work, they're, dealing with media, so mass media, and visibility and representation. And they both employed different tactics to raise awareness of the invisibility of certain, certain bodies and communities in mass culture, so, or mass media. So for example, Bethany's work, she uses uh, the Southern Review, a, a 1985 edition, and this edition in particular only had contributors of color after realizing that they had not had a very diverse uh, group of contributors in the past. And so Bethany goes through and redacts uh, many of the images, a lot of the text, and this removal, in this way, abstraction is mobilized, and this removal raises awareness of this 
um, the invisibility. In a very different way, Ayanna Moore, she has three particular moves. She um, takes a, I can't remember what year it was, but it was this, test this dating testimonial, and it's, you know, what men are like in your town. And it was, it ran in a specific issue of Ebony Magazine, and she changes the subject pronoun, so it becomes about women looking at women, and in particular, black women looking at black women. Um, and then she also changes the name of the person giving the testimonial and changes the testimonial bit. And those three moves raise awareness of the, the invisibility of the queer black female gaze um, in popular culture. So those are two examples of how abstraction is mobilized. Yeah. I mean, I have a, I kind of have, I, I feel like the energy going up in the room, so I'm going to turn it over after this next question. But this actually makes me think a little bit about how I would like to, I'm curious about your reflections as three curators working particularly in this area. Not to say that you only, you know, you only exhibit <laughs> works that are interested in abstraction, but seeing that there is a kind of resonance here, I'm curious to kind of get your reflections on why abstraction seems to be so hot right now um, and what you think that says about a certain kind of relationship to institution like to institutions to politics to the kinds of social worlds um, that maybe people desire but can't have access to or the protocols right around that like uh, in this last year I feel like there has been um, a real kind of velocity to this question and of course we know planning an exhibition takes a long time, right? And so people have had these, have been working on these things for years, but there seems to be some kind of crescendo um, and interest. I mean, look at everybody in this room, you know, on a Tuesday in the summertime to talk about <laughs> abstraction. So maybe, like, I would love to hear, you know, your reflection, like, why you think it might be um, of, of particular interest or urgency as a framework when it comes to, yeah, exhibition making or Approaches. I mean, I'll just jump in there and say, like, I don't, I think it's, it's interest. it's like we have to frame in, like, which space it's urgent or which space it's become so hot right now, because I think about, like, exhibitions, you know, like, Ken Kelleba Gallery, like, in the 1990s did a really important exhibition that was about, um, it was called, like, the, the Search for Freedom that was all about African-American abstract artists. Um, Kelly Jones did, you know, um, did an important um, show at the Studio Museum in the Harlem, you know, over 10 years ago, right? Like, so it's not like this interest has ever not been there. It's just about who now is catching on to it and, and why. So maybe that's the question <laughs> um, to ask. So that was just sort of my addendum to your question, but I'll think a little bit. And I have an addendum, which yeah. is why is abstraction the mode for engaging with these questions of identity or representation in this particular moment, and how is that a response to previous moments before it? But I think that I mostly curate abstraction, which is interesting because that's not what anybody wants to talk to me about. And I think mostly what other people want to kind of like tease out of my shows or like politics or identity or representation, which like without sort of trying to grapple why, with like why abstraction is the form of that. Um, and that those, this sort of meeting of these two like abstract form and like political or identitarian content is kind of where a lot of my exhibitions live. So I've thought about this question a lot about like why is it, would you want to latch on to, I, to identity or to content, but not onto form? And it became a, like a sort of question of like access, like what kinds of access people bring to abstraction or in the ways it like kind of forecloses conversation or whatever. But what I found was really interesting with the Monarchs exhibition was there was like a kind of third layer of access kind of present in this exhibition where I could go to a piece and really look at it and say like, this is a person who's thinking about flea markets in South Texas. And like there was a different kind of um, access based on like color, or culture, or, like places, of, um, like hanging out in flea markets. 
that I think also then bridge the sort of access gap for a group of people while creating another sort of access gap too. And I, I'd love to kind of also, what, what you said, Janet, about people have been engaging with abstraction, art historians and curators. Um, this exhibition in particular <laughs> looks at research over the past, I mean, at least 40 years, at least, but probably longer. Um, the first exhibition I look at is in 1967, I'm sorry, 1976, and it's by April Kingsley. It's called Afro-American Abstraction, and it, it showed on the East and West Coast, and that's really where, for me, the research starts. And um, so I really support what you said. I mean, who is who is at the table now who is in these conversations now? Might, that might have shifted from, it definitely has shifted, but the work is, people have been engaging with abstraction in scholarly ways for quite a while. Oh, I, um, it was something that Risa had, had said that just sort of made me um, think about an anecdote related to one of the artists in um, one of the exhibitions. I actually, someone, Shangor Son, who you also have a great interest in her work as well, um, who um, is an Eastern Cherokee artist um, whose work really engages a lot with the history of, um, um, of um, kind of, with Native history within the US, particularly Cherokee history, and sort of thinking about um, their nation's relationship to the U.S. There's sort of, um, I'm like looking for the, their, you know, li removal, sort of um, contesting for land rights, contesting for um, um, rights of history of boarding schools and kind of on and on and on and how all this history connects to the present. And um, about 15 years ago, there was a shift in this in her work, which used to be um, much more representational and direct to where she started to embrace um, using um, traditional um, Cherokee basket weaving forms, but the, kind of creating these conceptual baskets where the um, the paper that she's using paper to weave these baskets, but it's printed with like archival material um, that's like excerpt, you know, from the um, from treaties or um, that's like excerpts from the boarding school mission or all of these kind of historic things. And she talks about the way in which the kind of form, the beauty of the form seduces people into looking closer and then they get hit with this, um, with this history that they weren't expecting. Um, and I was thinking about that in relationship to the kind of question you were talking about with your work about, is there something about um, a kind of, the, the sensuality or the sort of seductiveness of particular um, works that some artists are kind of mobilizing as a tool, like I think with like Shan's work, she does that to then kind of flip the switch a little bit. Um, but that might also, um, in some cases, like help people al allied other issues if they don't want to confront them. That's not. I mean, I don't, and I don't say that as a way to circumscribe artists' intentions or practice, but thinking about other people who might be coming to the work. Yeah. Um, let's open it up to the floor. I'm going to turn around because I feel rude with my back to everybody here. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, let's start in the back. I was just wondering what's the difference between abstraction, figuration, and representation? Or is it more similarities? Who wants to take that? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so figuration includes the body, uh, a visible form, a visible body, right? Often it's figu the figure, so the presence of the figure. Representation is such a loaded word, it can mean so many things, right? Representation can, can mean a representational painting, right? Which is a painting that is, um, if it's a chair, then there's a painting of the chair and it represents the chair in a one-to-one in a -one way. Um, but representation can also mean visibility. Representation can also mean a voice. Um, so that, wor that word is kind of interchangeable. And abstraction, I mean, I think as we've talked this entire evening, uh, we all have different 
definitions. There is there is a art historical. There are. Seven and eight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's there's like one that is very much tied to painting. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, do y'all want to add anything to that? Yeah, well, I think with you think about tied to, to painting, um, and I guess for me, I always think about it as like objective versus non-objective is how I think about it. So, um, you know, something that's being made in relationship to something else that's real, like if you think about representation, and then sort of abstraction is kind of the moving away from, like as you move farther and further away from that. Um, but then I also think about how those things can be um, kind of confused and intertwined because um, you know color is real, like in all various <laughs> kinds of ways, right? It's not um, so. There is this, you know, this kind of binary that can be helpful, but in trying to create these sort of hard definitions. But I don't know that they're necessarily useful. And that binary yeah. is figuration and abstraction, right? Yeah, exactly. But there's like a third space, right? Or there's like a fourth space or a fifth space or well, a, I don't know. I feel like it's, it's like a, there's it's a the constellation, space and it's a then rhizome. <laughs> we, yeah. Yeah. You know, we try to we try to slice the space you know, to make it easy for us to talk about things, but I actually don't know that those, where we slice things is really, you know, we make it meaningful, but is it actually what's happening or real? I don't know, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, that's a really good question. I mean, so for many reasons, um, this is these are all taken from a film, um, and the the particular works that I included in the exhibition are based. The, these particular photographs or film stills are um, based on are taken from shoot uh, shoot she did in Chicago, L.A., and Detroit. So for me, I mean, just to kind of be honest, they're, they're really, those three cities are really important to me. Um, I was born in Detroit. I lived in Chicago for about 10 years, and I spent some time living in LA. And so thinking about how Martine was engaging with the landscape um, that is evident in a lot of these works, and you can't really see it in this image, but the fifth in on the left-hand side, there's the Detroit News. Um, there are different, different different kind of framing devices. Um, I also kind of think conceptually, um, this idea of mapping a landscape, this idea of trying to tell, uh, these films are all narrative-ish, um, trying to tell a story about an experience that uses a series of composite parts um, and how this narrative is inherently, I mean, I guess it's like the impossibility of it, right? The impossibility of telling this narrative. And so Martina is, is actually trying to talk broadly about a black experience, which I think isn't possible to tell through one lens, or it isn't possible to tell through one city, or it isn't possible to tell through one body. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of dealing with a lot of that tension. I, I hope that answers the question. Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, so um, I'm taking a cultural heritage class right now, and so we talk in our class about how um, the cultural heritage, the preservation of cultural heritage, creates <coughs> social memories. And I'm curious to know that you were talking about how you um, choose your um, uh, the, the abstract um, representations and the different artists. Um, do you take that into consideration when you're making the decisions on what artists you're gonna curate um, and how um, you're creating, um, the preserving cultural heritage and creating social memories. And 
Also, I'm curious to know, um, you mentioned how um, over, the, over time there's been a lot of focus on abstraction. What about those artists that don't necessarily do their work in abstraction? Um, do you feel like they're being excluded? Well, I, I think I'll start with the last part of your comment. So there's this phrase, like the expectations of representation, that if you're a woman, or you're an artist of color, or you're a woman of color, or you're, uh, if, you, if you are in any of these other spaces, right, especially in the art world, but broadly, um, how the work that you make has to speak to this embodied experience that you have, and so this expectation that your work is going to talk about biography when often, um, you know, artists who want to engage with abstraction, and it's more either traditional or non-traditional terms, are, are discouraged because there's this expectation that you'll talk about your experience or your work will speak to your experience. And, and so abstraction becomes um, a methodology to distance oneself from um, the expectations of representation, which include the expectations of figuration, the expectations of the body, the expectations of a certain essentialized experience that artwork is somehow imbued with. Um, and so that for me um, is, I guess, the answer I have. Um, I want to kind of um, go off of what you said and sort of talk about um, this idea of kind of cultural her heritage or, or maybe how that term that you're using might relate to what we're talking about. Because one of the things that I grapple with a lot is that tension between um, um, representation and needing the work to be the just be the work, right? So, on the one hand, like the way that, like for example, that you've organized this exhibition very purposely in constructing it as women, you know, um, female identified um, artists who are um, from the Black and Latinx diasporas, right? And the importance of that being marked as um, the need for that visibility so that we know that there are artists who look like us or curators who look like us who do this wide variety of work, but at the same time not wanting not wanting that identification to overshadow yeah. or be the only filter through which the work is seen. And can right? I tell yeah. you, so I actually struggled with that quite a bit because when all was said and done, and I mentioned this earlier in the talk at the Arts Club, I had a conversation with Lorelai and I was like, do we have to say female identifying? Do, can, do we have to say black and Latinx? Can I just say artists? Like, you know, and we, we went back and forth about it and I kind of was having this like, crisis of I don't know what. Um, and she said, you know, this really matters because without these, these particular words, it's a practice of erasure. And um, she said, you know, the reason why it's important to include these descriptive um, terms or, or just these ways of identifying the artist is because there has been such a lack of visibility, and, and she encouraged me to feel confident in, in identifying the space that, that the exhibition creates, because I was, there was this tension for me around like, now I'm othering this show, or now I'm setting up a stage for you know, people to engage with the work with all of these preconceived notions. So it's interesting that you mentioned that because it was something that was really tough for me. I mean, up until probably, the, and the wall text was already printed, so it was like, <laughs> like it was done, but, um, the <laughs> but the conversation was one that I was still kind of like biting my nails about um, because I didn't want to create a space where there was a lens already, I mean, other than the fact that exhibitions create lenses, right? But that there was another, an added dimension or, or third or fourth or fifth dimension put onto the work. You know, I really wanted the work to have an opportunity, or the artist's work to have an opportunity to speak in that space through the lens of the exhibition without having all of those descriptors. But, yeah. I can answer your question a little bit more, literally just because of the content of the exhibition that I made. Um, there's a number of artists in the show who are really focused on like recuperating lost or dying processes. So for instance, Margarita Cabrera is an artist who's, 
currently based in Texas and is originally from Monterrey and will go to small towns in Mexico, learn particular craft traditions, then bring them, like literally import them through her experience or body to the United States and then organize community um, events where she teaches those practices to brown communities or neighborhoods and then creates the work through the replication of that process. Other artists in the show are like Nancy Friedman Sanchez or in some cases Harold Mendez. Um, and I think for me the question was about um, what does it mean for all of these artists to be thinking recuperatively and trying to bring, for and it turned into kind of a part of the exhibition, exhibition that became about um, rebuilding the archive and like situating yourself on a temporal kind of continuum, like situating yourself in the presence in relationship to a kind of past that seems inacceptable, un inaccessible or unscripted and then as a way of sort of moving through time into the future. Um, thanks so much for this talk, it's been really exciting. I guess my question comes out of two things I heard Sandy kind of bring up in the framing. Um, she did like two brilliant things. One, she called you all practitioners, which I think is really important. Um, we are talking about abstraction piece of the artist, but it seems that abstraction is doing the work for you um, in the ways that you have not even approach, but do the work that you do. And then um, Sam also talked about abstraction as the particular taking the place of the universal, which is a hegemonic predicament of like the art world, right? How can white men, white men, um, stand in for um, the universal and that being the claim that they have to abstraction. So there's an interesting way that abstraction, you take it, becomes a way to respond to that hegemonic predicament without having to work with inclusion, without the working on the line of exhibitions being speaking back to hegemony. But I guess what I'm wanting to ask in that regard is you can speak towards your own style. Because on one hand, there's approach and there's method, but all those have one of the horizons, right? But when we think about a butterfly, and use that as an organizing principle to think about um, recuperation, it's very different from a method. And it's different to talk about materiality in particular ways that forces us to look at exhibition, not as something that you're putting in a frame or a lens, but you're making meaning as a curator. And I think style is a meaning-making process. I uh, wonder if can curious talk about style and make abstraction. And is it I'm doing it? Good. <laughs> now we're getting speed. Yeah. Um, let's see. There's so much in your question, it's so rich. It, um, style. Yeah, when I think about style, if I think about my my particular um, kind of curatorial practice, um, I think my you know, one of the stylistic things I'm interested in, like I'm very obsessed with um, the kind of phenomenology of the exhibition and like thinking of exhibitions almost like dramaturgy in a way. Like I'm, um, my colleagues, some of my colleagues are here, they'll know like I'm super obsessive about like how close labels are to things and <laughs> all that stuff. And I'm, I, th and, um, I think I tend toward um, like minimalism and exhibition design, um, thinking about be, um, everything having a space to breathe as opposed to um, this is the last show I'm going to be able to do that's thinking about this and having to pack everything in, right? So I think about, um, I tend toward um, wanting works that, I mean, I think all um, good artwork does it, but I think that works that really reveal themselves over time um, that so even if they're like two-dimensional or three-dimensional or not moving, that there's this um, there's a satisfaction with sitting with it and sort of try to think about the exhibition as a space that's conducive to viewers having the time to sit with, to take the time to sit with it. Um, I think that even when I'm engaging with the um, um, and I tend to kind of start with artwork and build exhibitions out rather than the other way around, right? That it's ideas um, sort of based in what an artist is really doing as opposed to like what I think sounds like cool. <laughs> um, and I think um, I also, even with exhibitions that are really um, conceptually and historically heavy, which I also tend to have an affinity for, um, that there, that the kind of aesthetic of the work tends to be very much um, 
uh, also engage in these questions of, of materiality and of, and of, of form. Um, so, yeah, maybe I'll... That, well, um, so when I make an exhibition, there's like kind of all of the parameters that I set forth for you today, like this geography, these terms kind of remixed in a certain way, but then there's this whole other kind of process that I'm going through that is never or rarely visible um, to the audience, which is like purely for me, and it's also... Um, something that I don't know that I'm doing until it's like a year into the project and I'm like, oh, obviously, of course. And usually that comes out at a certain moment when there's like a poetic aspect and the butterfly became that, which is also interesting because I go back and forth about like, it feels trite and it's also poetic and then it like is really meaningful at a lot of times and then also feels slightly cliche. But um, in this particular case, like the the sort of whole internal grappling that I was doing around this show was that I had been traveling for four years before and hadn't been in any one place for more than like four months at a time for four years. And so coming to Omaha, Nebraska was a way for me to be in one place for an extended period of time, which also didn't happen. And when I got there, the question of like, where do you come home to? Um, and what is home? And where do you land in a place that's like kind of where like you're from, but is not? And then how do you find that? So I think that kind of emotional or like personal processing is like a kind of subtext throughout that kind of also peeks through in moments with like lyricism. Yeah, I would say the first thing I think about is the site because exhibitions operate in different ways within different spaces. Um, I, what happens at Crystal Bridges is very different than what's, what can happen at Gallery 400. You know, so it's really about, um, I think about the viewer a lot and I think about the body and how a viewer is gonna think through space. So these are um, some really early questions that I ask myself, like what is the site, right? Um, and then I like to make it a bit impossible. I love site specificity. I also love multi-sided projects. Um, and I just, I, the idea of a derif, which was so poetically discussed um, in, in your introduction, is super important to me because a lot of it isn't um, this decentralization, right, is, is super important to me. This idea of collaboration is really important. Um, the agency of the viewer uh, or asking a viewer to kind of go on a journey uh, in a real way or in a you know kind of metaphorical way um, and how that entire experience of the exhibition becomes the experience of the exhibition um, and then beyond that you know things fall into place as they do um, but those are that's kind of my style yeah um, very grateful to your question because it made mine a lot easier to articulate um, so I'm mostly curious about Others' curation and, and to what extent um, <coughs> our reach echoes or differs from or reinforces what it is that you try to do in your work, and then um, more broadly, then um, you know, if you could speak of since of um, mentioned some particular through lines of inclusion, um, lack of inclusion, decentralizing, time horizon, whatever through lines are meaningful to you, if you could speak to the notion of. Um, Collaboration in relation to. Glad I don't have to answer. So I guess I think I just want to maybe just to um, make sure we understand the two parts of your question. The first part was really about us speaking to each other's curatorial practice, either about um, things that we glean from each other's curatorial practice or. Um, things that resonate, in in particularly in relationship to Allison's exhibition in Out, Out of Easy Reach. And, and then the second part um, was 
about kind of curatorial collaboration and how we, okay, just. Um, not necessarily an actual collaboration, mm -hmm. but just the feeling or the vibe of like, you know, as an artist, I really enjoy artists talking about each other's work rather than just their own. And so just sort of to speak to the, the vibe between curators and between shows mm -hmm. and whether you go and you're like, oh, like, you know, I, I saw a painting last night, and I'm like, oh man, I want to go to the studio, I don't want to make a painting that matches that, you know, so the sense of like this kind of friendly urging on, but then also possibly the sense of like, phew, they did that, I don't have to, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, I think you have the, the notion of how um, competition and collaboration works in like sports or athletics, and I'm just wondering if you speak generally to that dynamic, period, period, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'll go first, because <laughs> um, I am in the fortunate position of having had the opportunity to have extended conversations with Risa and also um, with Allison, like about your exhibitions and about your practice to be, be, see to see this exhibition in all three venues, um, and so I think, like, for for me, it's. Um, like, and I find them inspired, like inspiring, right? So I don't feel like, um, and this is like a, a kind of competitive thing, but it's more of an inspirational um, thing to, to see like the ways that um, we may have interest in, like say some, and sometimes we've exhibited like same artists, but have very different like approaches or sort of ways that we're thinking about it and kind of causes me to think um, differently, or to even see like work that w may have been familiar in a new way, um, and I feel the same about this ex your exhibitions uh, um, as well. I've had the opportunity to see all, all you know, all of them, um, and so I think, you know, or or even thinking about like you mentioned the Howard Dino Pendel exhibition that Valerie and um, and uh, Naomi did, where I was like at the end of that, I was like crying. You know, it was so. Um, important and beautiful and lovingly created that you could feel it um, in the exhibition, right? So I feel like um, I, I try to um, just kind of connect with um, and, and keep having those conversations that are um, inspirational and that kind of um, help me to um, keep um, thinking um, keep elevating my thinking and my practice. And I'll respond to the first question. Um, I had really similar kinds of debates with myself that you did around like, should I say brown and native artists in the title and sent out like a massive email to 15 people and tried to, you know, had a conversation about like mobilizing certain terms and how political nomenclature creates different kinds of possibilities for alliance which I think I see, because I think you and I chose very different terms. Like I chose brown in the end and you chose Latinx. And it was after a lot of, you know, reading a lot of exhibition catalogs about like how different political nomenclatures for identity categories had been mobilized from 1960s Chicano through like this blip in the 80s when Hispanic was like, Octavio Paz said in the 80s that it was the only word <laughs> that should be, like, that could gather a group of diverse people from the Americas. Um, and then in 2010, there's this sort of post-Chicano movement. So what kinds of framings can happen through what kinds of words? So I've been really interested in how you mobilized words to bring people together in a really different way than I did and like what what kinds of stories or works can be highlighted in that way so many. Um, well I mean I guess I can just briefly speak to your point of Latinx. I actually also had a conversation with Mia Lopez like in the nth hour where I was like Latina, Latinx, like let's talk about this. If I'm saying female identifying, like what am I doing here? Let's talk through this. Like how do I like what it, what what am I saying? Help me, you know, think through um, how I can mobilize um, based on the language that I include. And so um, 
I think this answers Jana's question, both, both questions. Um, I'm really reliant on my colleagues and their knowledge and really reliant on the moves that they make and, and the decisions and the ways that they invest themselves in certain conversations and scholarship. Um, and for me, it's a constantly negotiated space of, of you know, having the 15 people that you emailed or, or Janet thinking about the conversations that you might have. Um, and so, it, yeah, it, it, the collaboration unfolds um, in so many ways. And that's, I guess, the end of what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks to our panelists and Gallery 400. Yeah. Thank you.